Hey there, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Adrian. I'm a freelance artist, and today I'm going to be working on designing some stickers that I plan on making, as well as discussing some of my future plans on what I'm making for the next couple months. So feel free to sit back and bust your own sketchbook out and draw with me. And if you're stumped on what to draw on your sketchbook, I hope this helps. And if anyone is interested in a set of the stickers that I'm working on today, I give regular updates about my shop opening here and on my Instagram. I wanted to start off with a health update. As some of you know, I had to take a break from working towards my bachelor's degree in art because I suddenly started having a lot of nausea and lightheaded episodes to the point that I couldn't commute on my own and really struggled to even feel well enough to go to my classes. That all started in October of 2022. It's November of 2024 now. It took a frustratingly long time to get any real diagnosis and treatment options for my symptoms, and a lot of doctors kept chalking it up to anxiety or stress-induced nausea. I am happy to report, though, that it looks like I have a form of dysautonomia, specifically POTS, or postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. We still haven't gotten the nausea completely figured out, but that's been a lot better, thankfully. Originally, POTS was written off because I hadn't actually passed out during any of my episodes, and when my blood pressure and O2 stats were taken, I was always seated. And I was stressed by having an episode when I could feel my heart racing, so I didn't realize that I was actually having heart palpitations. I was sent to a cardiologist to rule POTS out for good, and after being gingerly walked to my seat like she was worried I was going to pass out, despite feeling fine at the time, I was informed that my heart rate was in the 130s, and that my blood pressure tanked to 80 over 60, and that's when I wasn't feeling symptomatic. <laughs> so I'm 20, almost 21 now, and I finally have an answer to what's going on, and I'm so thankful that it's not something more serious or fatal, but it's been a serious adjustment period for me. <laughs> I'm definitely feeling more hopeful now that I've got an answer to what's going on, and less like I'm in limbo with my future. I really couldn't plan to go back to school without finding out what the hell was going on with me, so now I'm back to square one and feel like I just graduated high school, not halfway through college like I thought I'd be at my age by now. If I do end up going back to school though, I probably won't be able to make as many videos. I might be able to make a few studio or art student vlogs, but I have a feeling I won't have the time I currently have to do all of my personal artwork on top of all the assigned pieces I'll have to finish. That's still up in the air though, and I've got quite a few upcoming videos in the works, so I'm not going anywhere just yet. Let's see, what else is new with me? I've recently gotten into the hobby of keeping houseplants and even a little bit of gardening. I moved from a house with a really nice backyard with lots of big old trees and plenty of space to make a garden into a townhome that quite literally fights against me growing anything outside. So I've been confined to brightening up the place by getting a little window shelving unit for the front windowsill of my house and filling it with succulents to greet people when they come in. My grandmother was really magical with plants and my aunt has a jade plant that was hers that's at least 60 years old. It makes for a really cool family heirloom, and I've got a cutting of her jade that turned 30 this year. She passed away when I was little, but I really cherished the little time that I had with her before she did. She used to sit out in the garden and whistle to the birds, and when she was younger, she used to make these gorgeous artificial trees, like Christmas trees with dyed red and green feathers from the craft store that she'd decorate with little things to act as ornaments, or bonsai trees made of wire and gemstones. I'm sad that she never got to be a full-time artist like I'm working to become. She only got to make her art as a hobby when she was older, but I like to think that she'd be proud that someone in the family is striving to do what they love for a living. I recently started going to the plant nursery that she used to go to. It's kind of like an indoor botanical garden, but they let you buy the crazy, giant, beautiful plants that are climbing up the walls. It's considered a bit of a tourist attraction to locals in my area, and I've picked quite a few plants up from them since I started visiting the place back in May. My current two favorite plants are jade plants and peperomia, which are a new species for me, but the more succulent-like nature of their obtusifolia and clusifolia varieties has made them a very low-maintenance plant. So I've got a little army of jade plants and other succulents to greet folks in one window, then have all my peperomias lined up on windowsills on the other side of my house, so that when the sunlight streams in through the curtains, the shadows make it look like I have a bunch of little bonsai trees in my window cells. Gardening has been considerably less fun for me, especially since I've become pretty heat intolerant because of my condition lately. 
So anything I do outdoors can wear me out pretty quick. And anyone who gardens can tell you that it can be a workout in itself, especially on a hot or really sunny day. For some ungodly reason, my development has these identical shrubs and bushes in front of our houses, but if you try to plant anything in front of them, you'll discover that you've only got six inches of mulch and topsoil to work with because there's concrete six inches under everything that they planted. Upon that discovery, a lot of the folks in my neighborhood have taken it upon themselves to start a pleasant little rebellion against the lack of space to plant, well, anything and have either gotten raised garden beds to replace the space where their bushes and shrubs were, or hired someone to create garden beds for them along the sides of their houses. I have decided to join in their efforts to try and make the neighborhood a little prettier, and the houses a little more unique, and planted some tiger lilies, Easter lilies, and Asiatic lilies into some raised garden beds this season. It's kind of been driving me crazy that I can't do much outside, so I'm really excited to finally brighten up the place and hopefully have a bunch of fresh flowers bloom in the springtime. The other reason that I've brought my grandmother up is because I've been thinking a lot about her lately, particularly because at the time I'm recording and filming all of this, Dia de los Muertos is upon us. I've been having a lot of fun getting some new decorations to set our ofrenda up this year. For those that don't know, Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is a holiday that originated in Mexico as a way to celebrate your loved ones that have passed on, particularly your family members. I really love this time of year, partly because Halloween is my favorite holiday, but also because in recent years I've tried to get a little closer to my family's Mexican indigenous roots, and the little artist in me considers setting the ofrenda up to be a fun annual art project. We recently lost a loved one in my family, my great uncle Larry. I mentioned previously that I recently inherited a dog. That would be his dog. She's a very sweet dog, and we really wanted to make sure that she was in a house where she'd be taken care of, especially since she meant so much to my great uncle. So in a way, my family has gotten a new member of the family in the sad passing of another. He'll be a new addition to the ofrenda this year. So I've been taking the holiday to remember that in the loss of loved ones, they're not completely lost if you remember them and the things that they loved. They've still affected your life in one way or another, even if they aren't here anymore. For anyone that's also celebrating Dia de los Muertos this year, or lost a loved one recently, please feel free to share any of your traditions for the holiday or a good memory of any of the loved ones that you've lost, because I like to think that they're still here with us in their own way when they're remembered and their stories are shared with those who didn't get to meet them. As I mentioned in my last video, I've been working on a lot of party planning for my mom's birthday. We both really love Halloween, so we decided to go all out and throw a big Halloween themed party for her. I'm talking a graveyard birthday cake, little ghost cupcakes, little shop of horrors inspired Venus flytrap cupcakes with little man eating plant monster strawberries on top. You name it. We're gonna have a costume competition. I got my dog a little Beetlejuice costume. Am I a little in over my head? Yes. It's so worth it though. I just really love this season. It gets really pretty where I live, because we've got quite a few areas with lots of trees, so you can just drive around and run your errands and you get to see all the colors of the foliage. I'm also a sucker for Honeycrisp apples and apple cider, and this is the peak season for them. And after the usual ungodly humidity that my area gets in the summer, it's nice to not have to be a hermit anymore and actually be able to leave the house without worrying about passing out or melting into a puddle especially since I'm a lot more heat sensitive because of my condition, so fall is my new equivalent of spring. That being said, it's been absolutely horrific for a lot of folks along the southeast these past few months because of Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton, so I'm going to attach some links to some programs helping communities affected by the latest storms for anyone who'd like to help out, and if you know any other groups helping those states out, please feel free to share them in the comments below. So let's get into what I'm working on here. If you saw my last video, I was considering turning my piece of a scene at a fish market into a print and mentioned that I'd be working on some stickers to match. Today I'm working on the sticker designs in my sketchbook where I'll be putting together the color palettes that I want first, then I'm going to clean them up on my iPad and turn them into some cute stickers. I know I've been teasing the opening of my online shop for a while and it's still in fair construction. I just want to make sure that I've got everything financially and legally set up before the official opening because not everyone knows the tax requirements when running a small business, even an online one, but I've got to get all of that squared away before I go selling anything. I'm starting small with a couple of sticker sets and prints, the first likely being that of the fish market, then some stickers of the fish I'm working on here, 
as well as the frogs with silly hats that I made back when I was starting the sketchbook. I'd also like to make some scientific illustration inspired prints, particularly that of moths or plant life and insects, especially some more beetles. I've been really enjoying drawing bugs recently, especially ones like dung beetles and scarabs with the cool metallic sheens to their shells and wings, so I think they'd make for some really eye-catching pieces. For anyone considering making merchandise out of your art, but feel unsure about where to start, or you just want to dip your toes into the water and see if anyone's interested in your work before putting a lot of money into making merchandise, starting off with stickers is a really great start. They're a more affordable piece of merchandise. I know a lot of artists collect stickers from other artists to stick onto the covers of their sketchbooks, and they make for really great gifts for friends and family that are into art and stationery. I for one really enjoy getting iron-on patches and vinyl stickers from wherever I go, because it's a nice keepsake that's small, but not something that you're going to grow out of like a shirt, and not too tacky. I got a couple of patches and stickers from my trip to San Francisco recently, particularly from Chinatown, Japantown, and the Japanese tea garden in the city's Golden Gate Park, as well as a bunch of cute little keychains to put on my pencil case and bags. I've been collecting souvenir stickers for a couple years now with the plan to stick them all on a travel sketchbook, but now I've decided to stick the stickers from where I went onto smaller travel sketchbooks so that each book can document all the individual trips that I go on. I did have to take a short hiatus from my channel as I went on a trip with my family. That was a little stressful as someone with POTS, especially with all the hills in the city, but it thankfully turned out a lot better than I expected. I had never been to San Francisco before, or even California as a whole, so it was really cool to see all of that for the first time. The architecture of the buildings around there alone was just so beautiful, so even when I wasn't really doing too much, it didn't feel boring with all the free sightseeing around me. I'd actually like to make a little series where I work on making some postcards or prints of what I saw during my trip, so if anyone would be interested in that, let me know. Essentially, every episode would be a video where I work on one piece at a time, talking a bit about what I experienced during that part of my trip, painting shots of some of the buildings, the animals I saw, or the food I had. I've been meaning to document my trips a little more artistically for a while now, and initially my plan was to make a couple of travel vlogs where I sat somewhere in the city and drew a particular place, but I didn't end up having a lot of time to film like I'd expected. My grandmother had a couple of sketchbooks and little postcard-sized pieces of watercolor paper that she brought with her while traveling with my mom in her later years. I thought it'd be a fun habit to get into too, and a nicer way of documenting all the places that I've been to, rather than just carrying a cell phone around and taking a bunch of photos of everything. So yeah, if anyone would be interested in seeing a short series like that, let me know. I'd be really excited to work on that. I've also been trying to check back in on my sketchbook goals. Some of you have seen my first video from coming off my previous hiatus after high school, where I started a new sketchbook at the start of 2024, vowing to finish it this year. That's been taking me a little longer than expected. In terms of the individual goals that I outlined in that video, I've been completing most of those, but I'm starting to really cram to get the rest of the sketchbook done, so you might be seeing a few more videos from me than usual. There's still a couple of other goals that I want to accomplish while I try to pick up the pace on finishing this book, particularly experimenting with stylizing my art differently and trying abstract art out, but so far, as long as I actually finish the sketchbook this year, this might be the first time that I've completed all of my sketchbook goals in one year, so I'm very motivated to finish this one. I've recently picked up a Talents Art Creation sketchbook during my trip to San Francisco, and I plan to make a review video for that, but as a little teaser, I was not as impressed with it as I thought I would be, given its current popularity across social media right now. I'm also working on a couple of art supply comparison videos, from fine liner comparisons to comparing my Posca paint markers to two cheaper alternative brands for those looking into picking up a pack of acrylic paint pens. For anyone interested in which sketchbooks I would recommend, I'll attach a link to my previous sketchbook showdown video below. I'm currently working in the lesser known version of Strathmore's softcover sketchbooks, their 500 series sketch art journal, which I really have yet to see anyone else use, but their mixed media sketchbook has been a pretty popular pick amongst artists here for a couple of years. Anyone who's seen my sketchbook showdown video might remember that I wasn't too impressed with their mixed media sketchbook in comparison to their sketch art journal. I was given the sketchbook as a birthday present a while back. I had never used Strathmore's sketchbooks at all back then, and I've been pretty pleasantly surprised with the quality of it so far, especially in terms of how it's worked with my gouache and watercolors. 
You can't do too much layering with it since it's a thinner paper than watercolor or mixed media paper, so it will start to warp and buckle, but if you don't mind that, or you use watercolor or gouache in a more mixed media sense, or without a ton of layering, I've enjoyed working in watercolor on this paper. It's really easy to make flat washes and smooth gradients on it. The colors turn out very bright, considerably more so than their mixed media sketchbook, which was one of the reasons I wasn't as into it. And the paper's got enough tooth to have a nice texture to complement my paints without making my work with fine liners or colored pencils difficult. My favorite medium with the sketchbook lately though has been marker and ink. As I said, I'll be turning 21 soon, so I'm thinking about treating myself to a couple of new art supplies this year, mostly because I can't go getting a bunch of new houseplants for myself since my birthday is so late in the fall. In particular though, I've been thinking about trying out a couple of Shinhan's gouache paints. They're not an incredibly well-known brand, and I think that's honestly a shame. They're a Korean art supply company, and I was gifted a set of 30 of their watercolor tubes back in high school, and I've adored those paints ever since. They are so creamy, they activate so quickly in my watercolor pans, and their colors are very vibrant, so I'll be really happy if their gouache is anywhere as good as their watercolors. I know a lot of people have been into Holbein's gouache or the newer sets by Hemi or Art X, but I wasn't too into Hemi's set when I bought them. And while Holbein is very well rated, it's a major budget breaker. Jackson's Art is currently selling some of Shinhan's 15 milliliter tubes for, I'm not even kidding, $4.70. In comparison, Holbein or similar artist grade gouache brands can have one tube running between $15 to $25 each. So when I saw Shinhan's were so much more affordable, I knew I had to try them out. Anyone interested in not paying 20 bucks a pop on gouache paints should definitely check Jackson's art out. If I do manage to pick a couple of those up, I'll definitely make a little review video cause I really wanna see if they're as good as their watercolors and I really wanna put you guys on these paints if they're really that good for that price. I think I've contracted a bit of something akin to stage fright sometimes when I'm filming these videos. I'm not going to film every single spread or page that I do in the sketchbook because, frankly, if I have to spend the time filming, editing, then recording commentary on every piece that I do in this book, there is no way I'm going to finish it by the end of this year. What I mean, though, is that I do have a bit of stress about when I show any mistakes that I make in the process, or how much I actually end up liking the piece quality-wise when I film these videos, and I think those nerves end up affecting how the piece turns out at times. That's really not how sketchbooks are supposed to work, but especially in the age of social media and having to promote yourself when you're a small business, I feel like I need to show all the pieces I'm working on to create a digital portfolio of sorts. That is before I can actually set an online portfolio of my work up on my website. That can become a little stifling for my art though, because if I'm worried about if the piece looks nice enough to post, I'm not testing out as many experimental techniques or new ways to make my art. I'm not branching out into something new out of fear it's not going to turn out nice, or worse, not going to look like I know what I'm doing. That's the opposite of what sketchbooks are for, though. I think because of social media, a lot of artists have become self-conscious about what they post or film, or how good their art looks, because now it's under this constant microscope. And when you're an artist trying to market and advertise your work yourself, there's the concern that if your art isn't perfect or stunning, or your best work at all times, that people aren't going to be interested enough in buying it from you. Sketchbooks are meant to be fun, experimental, and for practice, and warming up before doing final pieces, or making thumbnails to hash out what you really want before you make that final piece without risk of trying to figure that out on your expensive paper with your expensive art supplies. So if there's a goal that I really want to work on this year and next, it's trying to lessen that pressure to make everything perfect, to post everything, and to make sure that everything I post is perfect. Artists don't actually improve if they're too scared to actually experiment or try anything new, or God forbid, try something that they aren't naturally great at capturing just yet. I think some people, and especially younger artists, can get discouraged when they see these pristine, aesthetically pleasing Instagram feeds of people's art, but just like every other aspect of social media, you're looking at a heavily filtered aspect of someone's life. No artist makes absolutely stunning art all of the time, or started off making perfect pieces. It took practice and experimentation, figuring out what kind of an art style you want to have, and a lot of really 
really ugly pieces and mistakes and parts of the art process that aren't always going to look pretty in order to reach that level of skill that they're at now. So I really want to work on how I show my artwork online, as well as encourage others not to worry about being absolutely perfect all the time. And this is coming from a chronic perfectionist and recovering workaholic that has quit on way too many sketchbooks over the years because the pieces weren't perfect, or it wasn't all art that I wanted my friends or art teachers to see, so I'm still working on getting back into actually enjoying the process of making art, and balancing making pieces for myself, even if they're not actually how I envision them in my head, as well as making art that I can sell. So because of that, on top of my possible series on making watercolor pieces documenting my trip to San Francisco, I've been considering making a series of going through my artist journey. I'm not a pro just yet, but artists are always learning, so I thought I'd share my journey to pursuing my dream career. It's not always going to be immaculate art, but it's not supposed to be. I'm still learning, and maybe you can learn a thing or two from what I've already learned and what I've still got to figure out. I'd want to go through a series of different topics during this, from my thoughts on art school, to how I fight against art block and burnout, to what I've had to learn and set up in order to be a freelance artist and run a small business, or how to go about learning art techniques and business skills outside of going to art school. If anyone would be interested in that, let me know, because I'm very passionate about getting back to the times when I was little and didn't worry about if my art was perfect and just made art because it made me happy. Not because I needed to for an assignment, not because I needed to sell it. Because being an artist isn't easy, but I decided that this is what I wanted to do with my life. Because as far back as I can remember, it's always made me happy. And I have a pretty hard time imagining doing something all the time that I can't enjoy. So I'm motivated to make this work for me, even if that takes a different way of learning how to do my job than other folks or college students my age. Getting back into my piece here, I'm using a couple of different brands of alcohol markers with my Copic Multi-Liners to get my base colors down before I start layering the fish up with lots of gradients, then add some final details with my acrylic paint pens and Sakura Jelly Roll Moonlight Gel Pens. Anyone interested in any of these supplies that I'm using today can find a list of everything in the description. But for the most part, I used a combination of Michael's Artist Loft markers and my Prismacolor Premier markers. I recently picked up a few of the Artist Loft markers to work as temporary replacements for some of my older markers until I can invest in a brand new set to properly replace all of my oldies. I still have markers from when I was in middle school that are still in my collection and not dried out yet, but now that I've been able to use them more since my days aren't filled with hours of homework and studying, they're starting to really die on me, and it's nearly impossible to replace my Prismacolor markers since the only store around me that sells them stops selling them. And the company's official website doesn't have any way to buy them individually or even in bulk sets. I have managed to narrow down my choices for a replacement set between Ohuhu's Honolulu series and Ardex's ALP markers, but the color palettes are pretty similar between the sets that I'm looking at, so I've had a hard time choosing between them. I've definitely seen a lot of good reviews of both brands, but the real debate is if I want to spend more money on Ohuhu when they're offering a few less markers in the set for considerably more than Ardex, under the impression that they're a higher quality than Ardex, or if I'd rather go for getting more markers for less. Now, if I was made of money, I'd replace them with Copics. But Copic markers tend to run between $5 to $7 a pop, and I'm talking about replacing half of my entire alcohol marker collection, so that's not really an option here. The Copics I do have are great, because they are refillable, something I really wish other companies invested in doing with their markers, because I can easily get a large refill bottle for the colors that I run out of the most often instead of buying the same marker over and over again and having to toss out all of my old dried out ones. I was fairly impressed with the Artist Loft markers in quality out of the ones that I got, but as I expected, the fact that they're considerably cheaper than other brands led to some drawbacks with other aspects of the marker. The nibs are not that sturdy, I had one that started fraying within less than a month of getting it, and they don't seem to have as much ink as other markers, because I'm already buying a replacement for a marker I got two or three months ago, when I've got other markers that have lasted me years without a need for a refill. If anyone has picked up an Uhuhu or Ardex set, or even better, both, 
Let me know in the comments how you feel about the brand, especially if there were specific things about either brand that just didn't work out for you. I wish the Uhuhu brand was cheaper, but I also like to think that if they are charging that much for them, that they're gonna be better quality and more of that money is going towards the people that actually make them. I also hope that they'll last a little longer than the cheaper alternatives, because as much as I prefer the price of the Ardex set, after seeing how short-lived the Artist Loft markers are, I'm a little worried about if it's worth getting that big of a set, if they're not gonna last me long, and I'll just be back to where I am now with replacing them. I also can't help but wonder how much they're paying the people that actually make these markers if they're offering them for so low of a price, so I might just go for it with the Ohuhu set. My other favorite part of making these fish today was using my paint pens and gel pens. And as for someone who's been using Sakura's gel pens for a couple of years now, my trick for anyone that's used them before but found that they weren't flowing as evenly as you'd like them to, is to work with them slowly. And practice slowly filling little boxes and circles in on a scrap piece of paper before using it on your piece. This really seems to help the pen sort of warm up beforehand, and if it really is still skipping on you, or just not letting any ink out of it, then it hasn't made any weird marks on your final piece, just the scrap piece of paper. I say the same thing if you find the coverage of a paint marker isn't as opaque as you'd like. If it's still too transparent for your liking, let the layer dry, then go over the section again now that you've got a light base layer of the product for the paint to stick to. If it's dry, it should easily give a more opaque coverage, but if you don't let it dry between the layers, you might leave marks because you're just pushing the nib into wet paint. My main technique with these fish was to emphasize all the colors that make up their scales rather than try to draw all their scales and risk cluttering the piece up with too much line art. I think my favorite technique that I picked up while working on these guys was using my Moonlight gel pen on top of a really dark color to get that nice pop of contrast, then ground it a little better into the piece by getting my fine liners and making tiny outlines around the shapes that I made in gel pen so that the edges blend back into that rich color behind them. If I had to pick a favorite of my fish today, I'd probably say the little grumpy guy in the top right corner that I made a sort of sunset gradient for that's covered in bright blue dots. He was a lot of fun to work on, and even though I had to do some blending to get a smoother transition between all the different colors on his scales, I think he turned out the closest to how I initially envisioned him looking at the end. So I'm just really happy that he turned out his plan so well. I'm very excited to turn these little fellas into stickers, especially the blue and red one, and my grumpy guy in the corner. If any of you would be interested in picking a couple of stickers up when I start rolling them out, you can subscribe here for the latest updates on my shop opening, or follow me on my Instagram in the description for my most up-to-date announcements on my shop. And as usual, if you have any questions about anything, whether it be about any of the supplies I'm using, a technique I used, or if you're just curious about what it's like to be a freelance artist, I'm happy to answer any questions in the comments here or through direct messaging on my Instagram. So that's about it for me today. I want to thank you all for watching and hope you have a great day. I'll leave you with some music in the background for the rest of this video. And I hope that I inspired someone to take a break and relax or work on some art even if it's something simple. This is my friendly reminder that as long as it makes you happy, it doesn't have to be something grand or finished or perfect. So I'll be seeing you next time. Bye!